Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 210. Turn to page number 210, make sure the book is in front of you so that you can follow the work. Page 210, the very first problem on the page, number 326. Number 326 says, or rather asks, the volume of right circular cylinder. The volume of like right circular cylinder, as you know, the circular cylinder looks something like this. In, in order for us to find the volume, before we start the work, in order to find the volume, we need to know two things. We need to know how wide open it is on the top, which is, which is the area of this circle, which is pi r squared. So we need to know the radius. There are two things we know. We need to know the radius of this thing, how wide open it is, and we need to know how deep it is. How deep it is. If, if we have these two pieces of information, we'll be able to answer this question. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the height is 20. Well, the height is 20, well, that's very useful information, but that's not enough because we also need to know the radius to figure out how wide open it is on the top. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by itself is not enough, answer cannot be A or D, it would have to be either B, C or E. The second statement tells us that the area of the base, area of the base is 25 pi. Area of the base is this right here. Area of the base is this right here, which is same as this one. So they actually do better than that. Instead of giving us the radius and, and let us figure out the area of the base, they tell you what the area of the base is. But again, by itself, we cannot tell what the volume is because we don't know the height. The height is what's given in the first statement. So second one by itself does not do the job, but putting them together does the job nicely. If you put them together, that's all. Air, the volume is going to be, as I said, it the volume of a right circular cylinder depends on how wide open it is, which is the area on the top, the opening on the top, times how deep it is. We know this quantity, 25 pi, and we know the height, 20. There you go, that's your volume. Nothing to it, very simple, very straightforward. Let's do the next one. I didn't get my eraser ready ahead of time, so I have to do it right now. You know my high-tech eraser that I have. So we're going to get it ready. Voila. Next one, number 327. 327, let's see what this says. Number 327 tells us that R and S, R and S are positive integers. The question is, is R plus S, is R plus S even? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that R is even. Knowing that R is even does not tell us what R plus S is going to be. If S is even, then of course the sum is even. If the S is odd, sum is not even, obviously. The first statement by itself does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that S is even. Again, knowing that S is even in itself cannot tell us whether R plus S is even. If S is even, but R happens to be odd, then the sum is going to be odd. If R is also even, then it's even. You get the idea. The second statement by itself does not do a job, but if you put them together, it becomes a very simple problem, very very childish problem. If R is even and S is even, then of course the sum is even. We can answer this question. Is R plus S even? The answer is yes, it is. Yeah. So if you put them together, we can figure, we can, we can answer the question. The answer is C. Number 328. Some of these problems are very silly, very silly in the sense that they are actually gifts, and some of them require some work. Next problem, next question is asking us, is x less than y? In this picture that we have here, so we're given a 
triangle here, x, y, and z, p, q, r. This is how the picture is given to us. Obviously, they're going to give us uh, looking very, very, very much like an equilateral triangle. And they tell us, okay, there actually there is no z. Z is 58. They tell us that this angle is 58. They tell us that this angle is 58. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that PQ equals QR. Where is PQ? Right here. PQ, we are told, equals QR. What are you? If PQ equals if PQ equals QR, then it's an isosceles triangle. Then it's, a, then it's an isosceles triangle. If this is 58, if this is 58, then this must be 58 because these two sides are equal. Now we can figure out the y. y obviously is 180 minus 2 times 58. And once we have the value of y, we can answer this question. Is it, is it less than or more than or equal to? We don't have to do it out. We can answer it. First statement by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E. Because the first statement by itself is enough for us to figure out whether or not x is more than y, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether the answer is yes or no. What matters is that we can answer the question uh, definitively. First statement does the job. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that PR, PR is greater than QR. PR is greater than QR. What that, what that means is that in any triangle, in any triangle, the opposite sides and angles are proportional. The larger side in the triangle faces the largest angle. The smaller side in the triangle faces the smallest angle. So what this tells us is that the angle facing side PR, the angle, the angle facing side PR is going to be greater because PR is greater than QR than the angle facing side QR. And to make it easier for us to see, we can redraw this picture. Let's redraw it just the way they tell us. They tell us that PR is greater than QR. So let's redraw it. Here's our PR. And here, here's our QR. This is our Q. Here you go. PQR. As you can see, PR is larger than QR. And therefore, the angle that faces QR, this angle, is going to be smaller than the angle that faces this side. The angle that faces PR is this angle right here. And they're calling this angle X and they're calling this angle Y. There you go. So that means X is smaller than Y. There you go. The answer is yes. Again, the point is not, the point here is not that the answer is yes. Answer could have been no also, but the point here is that we are able to give a definitive answer whether or not x is more than y. Second statement by itself does the job also beautifully. The answer here is D. Both of those statements independently are enough to be able to answer the question. Let's move on. 329. 329. Let's see what 329 has to say. 329 says that S is a set of odd integers, odd integers, and it has 3 and negative 1 in it. Question is, does, does this set does S contain negative 15? That's not how I have it written in my notes here. What I, what I have written here is does negative 15 belong to set S? Does negative 15 belong to set S? The same as saying does S, S contain negative 15? Let's see what we have. The first statement tells us that uh, 5 is in set S. 5 is in set S. So let's, let's put together our set S. The set S they're talking about, we know it has 3 and it has 3 and negative 1 in it. It has 3 and negative 1 in it. And they are all consecutive odd integers. You notice, you notice I, I left some space here open. I left this space here open. Just because it is negative 1, it, just because it has 3 and negative 1 in it, does not necessarily mean that it has 1 in it. We do not know that yet. Because they do not say that they have to be consecutive. It may have 1 in it, it may not. 
We shouldn't take liberty, we shouldn't assume things. It may have it, it may not. But that's not the point here. The point here is that, what we want to find out is that, does negative 15 belong in this set? We know it has 5. If it has 5, then as long as it, as long as it has negative 3 in it, as long as it has negative 3 in it, it will have negative 15. Or, if it has 1 in it, and negative 15, this product negative 15 will be in there. Or, maybe it has negative 1 and positive 15. Or maybe it has negative 3 and positive 5. You get the idea. You get the idea. But we, we do not know. We know it has, we know it has 3, we know it has negative 1, and we know it has 5. It has 5. So based on what we have, based on what we know there, based, based on what we know here, is that, no, we cannot tell if it's negative 15 in there. How can we tell? There's, there's nothing in there to tell us. It may have negative 15, it may not. It may not. We do not know what, what the set contains. All we know it is that it is a set of odd integers. It may have negative 15, it may have positive 15, it may have... What we need here, in order for product to be negative 15, in order for product to be negative 15, we know it has 3 in it. We know it has 3 in it. We know it has... This is the same as before. We, we know it has... Let's, let's erase this thing. This was too much. We know it has 3 in it. So, the question is, does it have negative 5? We do not know that. We know that uh, it has negative 1 in it. We know it has negative 1 in it. Does it have positive 15? We do not know. We do not know if it has positive 15. We cannot tell. We cannot tell whether or not uh, it has negative 15 in it. First statement by itself. First statement by itself is not enough. Let's look at second statement. Now, when we're looking at second statement, we're going to erase everything that was told in the first statement. We were told in the first statement that it contains 5 in it. So we're going to erase now 5. The 5 is no longer there. All we know at this point is that it has 3 in it. It has negative 1 in it. It may have 1. It may not have 1. That's why we have a question mark here. So let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that that if M is in S and N is in S, then their product M times N is also is also is in set S. That's what that's what the second statement tells us. Is that enough to figure out whether or not uh, whether or not it has negative 15? Again, the answer is no. All we know is that if one number is in the set and the other number is in the set, its product must also be in the set. So based on what we know so far, the only thing that we can say so far definitively is that negative 3 also belongs in the set. Negative 3 also belongs in the set because 1 times... and positive 3 also belongs in our test. Well, actually, we don't know, we do not know, about, we do know about the 1. Negative, negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. So based on what we know here is that it has negative 3 in it. And that's all we can say. We cannot tell for sure whether or not it has negative 15 in it. Let's put them together. Let's put the first step and second step together. Let's put the first and the second step together. Oh, I shouldn't have raised that. I shouldn't have raised that. The first statement told us that 5 is in five is in set S. So second statement was not, not enough either. A, D, B, C, E. Let's put them together. So here's our set S. Here's our set S. We know it has negative 1. It has, uh, it has 3. And we know it has 5. And we also know that if... Oh, we are done actually. Well, if it has 3 in it, if it has 3 in it, and it has negative 1 in it, and it has 5 in it, well, let's see, let's see where we can go with it. Okay? Let's first talk about whether or not it has 1. Just out of curiosity, it doesn't, it, it's not going to play any major role here. Does it have 1? The answer is no, it does not have 1, because the only way you can have 1 in it, the only way we can have 1 in it is that it has to be a product, any number that we see here, has to be a product of two numbers that appeared in the set before. The only way we can have negative one, uh, ne the only way we can have one here is if we have negative one times negative one. But obviously we know that in a set an element cannot be repeated. An element cannot be repeated. One does not belong here. 
one one does not belong in a set. So how do we how do we figure out if you put them together? Well, we know we know it has negative one, and we know it has it has three and it has five. Well, if it has three and if it's five, it must have fifteen because it tells us that if one number appears in the set and another number appears in the set, if m appears in the set, if m appears in the set and n appears in the set, then their product must also appear in the set, which means 3 times 5 is 15, 15 must appear in the set. And therefore, therefore, if 15 appears in the set and negative 1 is already there, which means negative 15 must also be there, which means negative 15 must also be there. The answer is C. Putting them together, it does the job. Now I have negative 3 Oh, other, other one would be, here's the other one, here's the other possibility I'm going to put them in a different color Here's another possibility If 3 is there and negative 1 is there, negative 3 is also there Negative 3 because 3 times negative 1 is negative 3 Negative 3 is also there and 5 is also there, there you go so there is negative 15. That tells us the negative 15 must be in the set. Uh, the way we can figure out the negative 15 is in the set is the, what we just described here. Because we have 3 in here, we have 5 in there, which means we must have 15 in there. If 15 is in there and negative 1 is there, then the product of negative 1 and 15 is negative 15. Negative 15 must be there. And this also works. This also works because if 3 is in there and negative 1 is there, negative 3 must also be in there. Therefore, negative 3 times 5 must also be in there. Answer is C. Putting the, two, putting the two together does the job. As you can see, as you can see, some of them require some, some thinking, some of them require some simple calculation, and some on the other hand are quite easy, very straightforward. If they tell you that A is even and B is even, and one statement tells you that A is even, and the second statement tells you that B is even, then obviously A plus B must be even too, the one we just did. 330. Is, is integer x, is integer x, a three-digit integer? Is integer x a three-digit integer? Let's see what it tells us. It says x is the sequence of an integer. Not sequence, what the hell? S is the s is the square of an integer. What I said a little while ago makes absolutely no sense. Just ignore it. Do you understand? Just ignore it. Every once in a while I go cuckoo. In other words, x is the square of an integer. What they're telling us is that x, what they're telling us in a roundabout way is that x is the perfect square. Well, simply knowing that x is a perfect square does not tell us that x is a three-digit number. It could be anything. The integer could be any perfect square. It could be four, nine, or anything. It could be, it could be, uh, it could be 400 for that matter. It could be any square. It does not tell us that it's a, it's a three-digit integer by itself. All we know is that it's a perfect square. The first statement does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A, O, D. Let's look at the second one. Any perfect square belongs here. So far, what we know. And therefore, we cannot tell for, with certainty that it is, it, it, it is a three-digit integer. It may be, it may not be. Is it a three-digit integer? Not necessarily so. It may be. Second statement tells us that it's between 90 and 150. Again, simply knowing that it is between 90 and 150, x is, x is between 90 and 150, just looking at second statement by itself. Don't look at the first statement right now. We cannot tell whether it's a three-digit integer or not, because it could be anything between 91 and 149. The second statement does not do the job. But when we put them together, when we put them together, 
what we realize is that if it's greater than 90 and less than 150, which means it begins with 91, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, and 99, these nine integers, none of them are perfect squares. And the first statement tells us that it must be a perfect square. None of them are perfect square, which means when we put them together, x has to be either 100, the next one is 11 square, which is 121, Next one is 12 square, which is 144. Next one is 13 square, which is 169. Does not belong here because it has to be less than 150. Which means x has to, putting the two statements together, tells us that x has to be either 100 or 121 or 144, based on the fact that it has to be between 90 and 150. And second condition, that it must be a perfect square. Well, if it's a perfect square and it's between 90 and 150, the only, only value x can assume is the only values x can assume are the only values x can assume are 100, 121, 144. Therefore, it doesn't matter what x is. We can answer the question: Is it a three-digit integer? The answer is yes. It is a three-digit integer because it's either this, this, or that. The answer is C. Putting putting the two statements together, we can answer the question. Number 331. Number 331. These are actually sometimes very clever questions. I always admire the people who write these questions. Not to be able to solve this question, but to be able to come up with them. That is, that is, that is an intellect on a different level. It says, 331 says, the first term, first term of a sequence of a sequence is zero. My handwriting is atrocious. First term of a sequence is a big fat zero. We are told that the second term is one. Question is, is, is the fifth term is the fifth term equal to negative two, or rather positive two? Let's see what they tell us in the first statement, shall we? It says each odd number term, each odd number term is either a zero or a two. And the question is, what's the fifth term? Let's find out, shall we? First fifth term, because fifth term is an, uh, is, is an odd number, because fifth, is, fifth term is an odd number, therefore what the, first statement tells, what the first statement tells us is that since each odd number term is either 0 or a 2, fifth term has to be either 0 or a 2. The question was, is the fifth term 2? Maybe, it may not be, it may be 0, it may be 2, there's no way to tell. The first statement by itself is not enough. Let's look at second statement. The second statement tells us that the third term, third term is 2. Again by itself, knowing that the third term is 2, we know that the first term we were told, first term we were told is 0, second term we were told is 1, now they tell us the third term is 2, there is no way for us to tell the fifth term just by looking at itself. Second statement does not do a job. When we put two together, when we put the two statements together, still we cannot tell. Still we cannot tell. All we know is that each odd number term has to be either a 0 or a 2. So this term again could very well be 0 or it could be 2. There's nothing in there that tells us there's nothing in here that leads us to believe that it's either a 0 or a 2. It could be either. The answer is E. The answer is E. That was number 331. That's to 332. Very last one on the page. It says, 
is the sum of four particular integers even. At this point we know nothing about those four integers as to what they are. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that two, two are odd and two are even. There we go. If two are odd and two are even, we're going to use we're going to use letter D to represent odd, and we're going to use letter E to represent even, instead of using O for the odd, because that gets confused with zero. So there we go, we have four terms, two of them are odd, and two of them are even. And the question is, is the sum even? Of course we can answer this question very easily, because odd plus odd, three plus five is eight, which is even, odd plus odd is even, and even plus even plus even, of course it's going to be even. We can answer the question. Is the sum of the four part for particular integer even? The answer is yes it is. Yes it is even. A, D, B, C, E. Because we are able to answer the question using the first statement alone, we know answer cannot be B, C or E. It would have to be either A or a D. Again, as I always remind you, the point here is not that the answer is yes. The point here is not that the answer turned out to be affirmative. It could, it could very well have been negative. Even if it turned out that no, the sum is not even, it would still be, we would still cross out B, C, and E because first statement by itself does enable us to answer the question either in affirmative or negative as I always remind you. Keep that in mind. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that the average, average of these four terms is an integer is an integer. Their average is a whole number. Their average is a whole number. Let's make up four numbers here. A plus B. Let's use let's use different one because the letter D will confuse us with the R. We don't want to do that. Let's use something else. P, Q, R and S. And when we divide that by four to find their average, that turns out to be an integer. Let's turn out turns out to be an integer. Let's call it K. Are you with me so far? The question was is there some even. Well, which means their sum p plus q plus r, p plus q plus r plus s must equal 4 times k. Because we're calling their average, their average we're calling it k. Therefore, it does not matter what k is, whether the k is an odd number or even number. We know it is an integer. We know, we know the average is an integer. And the average could be 13 or it could be 30 makes no difference to us whether k is odd or even because 4 is even and therefore whether this is odd or even makes no difference any number times even would still be even and that represents their sum p q r p plus q plus p plus q plus r plus s which is their sum which is 4 times some number it makes 4 times some integer it makes absolutely no difference what that integer is whether that k the average whether it is even or odd it makes no difference because we are multiplying by 4 and therefore, even times, either even or odd, would be an even. So the answer is yes. Their sum is even. Their sum is even. Second statement by itself is also enough. Therefore, the answer is D. Each statement, each, st each statement by itself does the job quite nicely. The answer is D. That is the end of this page there. And that's where we're going to stop. We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll do some multiple choice problem as we have been doing. If you found this helpful, I forgot to say this in the beginning of the video, if you find this helpful and if you would like me to help you get better prepared for the GMAT, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire my services, you can reach me at Keshwani Prep, P-R-E-P Prep, Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Alright? Bye now.